Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we wish that you have a very good um, Harvest 2020 and a good start to it. In light of the things that we've been facing in the county, we had a conversation with ETS Labs last week to kind of get an update on the status of their operations. And we're really excited today to have Gordon Burns join us to tell us a little more about what's been going on with them, the amount of sample intake that they've had, how their accreditations work, and so we really learned a lot in speaking with him last week and thought it would be very beneficial to invite him to do this for our membership. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, Gordon has a couple of his team members on the back end that will help field Q&A. He'll present for 10 or 15 minutes um, and then open it up for questions. Please put all questions in the Q&A and then use the chat feature only to make comments. We also will be sure to follow up and give further information if any of the questions aren't answered in the chat or are not answered to the fullest extent. So please keep your questions in the Q&A. All right, guys, I'm gonna turn it over to Gordon now. Thank you again for joining us. And there you go, Gordon. Well, good morning, everybody. I see we have quite a few people on over 30 at this point, probably more will pop in. Um, yes, we had a, we had a, a long conversation with, uh, with Vintners last week, and I thought that was useful to help share some information. Many of you out there uh, will have uh, some questions about ETS, just operations and what's going on. And why the heck is it taking so long to get results for smoke related samples, of course, which is the question number one these days. So I thought that I maybe should just tell some background and so you can see what's going on and what you can expect moving forward, even more important. So in 2017, um, we, we were challenged, of course, all of us with the horrific fires back then, and DTS was also challenged. We, uh, we brought a lot of analytical capability to the table back in 2017. And then I looked forward and said, you know, uh, what can we do that we don't have to the extent possible any delay in producing results in another event when it happens, not if, we all know that. Well, so along came this event. Um, well, in between we had 18 and 19 and uh, responses to people who were impacted in those areas were essentially with no delay whatsoever. Um, then we had 2020 and if there's anyone on the call that uh, could have predicted uh, what was going to happen during 2020. I'd love to talk to you offline so we can go to Las Vegas together and make a lot of money. Uh, it's completely unpredictable um, what was going to happen. Here's a reality check about the, the, um, the uh, smoke analyses in general. So these are analyses that actually were first developed, the earliest versions of them in our lab by Eric Carave in 2008. Um, and he, at those, in those years, he presented the outcome from that in, uh, in Bordeaux and other places. And the analytical techniques have been tuned since then. And we've uh, shared and made them available to others around the world, both researchers and um, and commercial laboratories. So these um, techniques are not simple. And the limiting steps are number one, people. Um, handling berry samples is as you, all of you do it, and you know that it's not that simple. But I'll get to the numbers in a minute and you'll, you're gonna say something along the lines of, oh my gosh, or perhaps something stronger than that. Um, the once we have the people factor and the handling the samples and getting ready for the analytical part of it, there then we need devices that are, some of you are extremely technically savvy who are on the line and others may not know about this equipment. So pardon me if I'm too, um, uh, too basic. Uh, the, we use something called gas chromatography and mass spectroscopy, GCMS. That's what I'll refer to it as. Those are pieces of equipment that uh, installed are gonna cost about $200,000 each. 
And then we use another version of that called GCMSMS or QQQ, lots of acronyms. And that's GC mass spec, mass spec triple quad. And that's kind of the big brother or big sister of the GCMS. And those are more like $300,000 installed. Okay, so um, we upped the number of those things that were online since 2017. And today, as of physically today, we have combined 10 of those instruments running in our laboratory 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have also, in addition to that, um, six more systems that are um, five of them brand new, another one which is an upgrade, uh, which will be coming online, a couple of them within days and the others within a week or two. So we'll have a total of 16 um, instruments running this stuff. Why do you care about that? Why, you know, about internal workings? Because it gets down to mathematics. So one of these instruments, including appropriate quality assurance and, um, and accounting for the inevitable downtime and maintenance and everything else, it averages out that they can generate about 30 uh, reportable samples a day, not an hour a day maybe as much as, as 40, so 30 to 40 a day. Um, and uh, on typical days leading up to now, we've been receiving in excess of 1,000 samples a day. So some days as high as 1,200 samples, and that's for combined berries and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, wine samples resultant from micro-fermentations. The why, are, why does ZTS have those horrific, and I agree that they are horrifically long turnarounds, it's math, divide, divide out the number of instruments and number of people supporting them into those totals, which now are in excess of 9,000 samples in the lab, and you see why the uh, backlog is there. So I don't, I hope this doesn't sound defensive. It's meant to be able to help you understand what to predict for tomorrow and the next day because we're not through this harvest at all. Um, the, uh, these are realistic limits. What else are we doing? Well, we've, uh, we've worked with um, um, three to four external other laboratories to help them understand and try to try at least to know that their results might correlate with what we would produce in order to bring additional capacity. Um, some of those laboratories can bring one instrument to play. Some can bring two, others maybe three or four. So you see the, those, are, those are valuable, all those collaborations, but they're not going to change the um, the practical reality of the turnaround times, unfortunately, even with them fully in play. And I've had calls from two of them to say, well, you know, we're at capacity now. Can you accept any more samples, Gordon? So the combined efforts of uh, a number of laboratories, uh, simply the, there's more water than there is bucket in this situation. Why is that? Why is it so much different than 2017? Well, maybe some of you on the call can answer that better than I can. I'm probably so. Uh, but my, my view of that today is that it's largely driven by the crop insurance issue, um, where in 2017, the insurers were, uh, were essentially hadn't figured it out yet and or they had fairly, fairly high limits of what were, was acceptable in order to enable crop insurance to become activated. Um, and this year, uh, the considerably different where people are being told that, these, this is my understanding, ready to be corrected, that anything greater than 0.5, which is currently our minimum reportable concentration for berries, is, uh, is a uh, cause for claim coupled with a statement from the winery that they can't make wine from that. And then I've heard repeatedly that the insurance companies are saying, look, you don't have to have the actual number today, but you have to have your sample in the lab in the queue 
if you want to uh, invoke coverage down the road. So therefore, far more than half of those samples that are in the lab are in the queue because of this crop insurance issue. They need a number down the road. Of course, they'd love it today, but they need it down the road. And then that leaves the other half of the samples where people are trying to make um, real-time practical decisions that relate to this harvest and what they might do differently than what they're doing, um, what they're doing today and what they're going to do with all that fruit on the vine from one perspective or another, or how they're going to make wine from that, from those. And that's, and that's a, a huge problem. I wish I had a wand that I could wave at that queue and detect which ones were there for the purposes of crop insurance and which were decision-making samples. And if I could, I would, but I don't have that wand. And it uh, uh, means that it results in a slower turnaround for everybody. Yeah, so that's kind of a, kind of a background. Um, as to the analysis that we're, we're actually offering today, what are the capabilities at ETS? Well, those of you who followed this thing closely know that, that um, we, the sort of the most inclusive set of what the knowledge is today, and it may very well be different by next year, would suggest that you should run um, a, an analysis that looks at the individual glycosylated, which means smoke uh, sugar attached compounds. Those are the ones that are not um, sensorily active today, predominantly. And that uses a tool called LCMSMS, more acronyms. Um, you too can have two of them for a million too. And, uh, they, and we have this analysis. We've had it for a year and a half or more. <clears throat> We've built what we believe to be a um, an extraordinarily rugged methodology, but there are two limitations, actually three, that come into play, which is why we're not, we're not offering it today. And the, the, these limitations are the following for those who are interested. Um, the first limitation is that analytical standards for the compounds that we want to report, there are six of them, uh, do not exist with one exception. And the what are known as internal standards that one needs to use to run this LCMSMS also today do not exist. And I mean across the globe anywhere. Um, they can be made and they are being made due to an initiative involving Wine Institute, an organization that I participate in called FIVS internationally and some others. And they're being produced as we speak but they didn't exist before. When these compounds are available, um, it will mean that for the first time ever that laboratories around the world, both um, commercial laboratories, industry laboratories, and academia will be able to use the same compounds to, to do their calibration. Because they, they aren't commercially available today, these standards, uh, the results may may agree in pattern from one lab to another, but they won't agree quantitatively. And that means to draw any conclusions using the learning experience of other labs is today impossible. When will this happen? Not in time for this event. Uh, within months, certainly, those calibrations will be in place in our lab and I know in uh, several other industry labs. And then we'll, um, of course, be certain that all of academia knows that they're available as well. Okay, these are the glycosylated compounds. A second reason that they're not on offer uh, right now during this event is that all grapes have all of these glycosylated compounds natively at some con concentration. So therefore, in Australia, for example, uh, they've spent several years running analyses on samples from non-smoke impacted years to build a database of what those background levels are that are normal, if you will, for a given variety coupled with a given geographical location. And then when they have samples from Australia and you compare it to that list, you can say, well, does it in general fall within that range or is it higher than that range? 
This list does not exist, this database, for the U.S. wines at this point. We have solicited samples from many of our clients over the past couple of those couple of years since we've had the equipment in place. And we have some several hundred samples into this database already, but it's not adequate today to be able to interpret uh, analysis, even if we did offer it. Um, and interpreting it against some other database from a different continent, probably not appropriate. So this is, uh, uh, this year is complicated because we can't use samples from this year to build the database, can we? Because even if there's even incidental smoke exposure that wouldn't cause it to be not commercially acceptable, it would be too much to represent what normal is for unaffected grapes. Second reason. Third reason, the lab is about to burst. Um, I've lost valuable employees who simply melted down uh, in the current circumstance and uh, were working, as I said, 24 seven, as are many of you in the industry. So we're not unique. Um, but uh, offering that analysis while we're, while we're trying to get out what we're through the, the through, through the queue of what's in the laboratory today would be too much. Um, a second analysis that that you would might ask about is, well, I would like to look at the volatile compounds among two, two of which are guaiacol and 4-methylguaiacol, but I'd like to look at a more comprehensive list. Yes, we have that analysis. We are able to do that. That's run on the device that I referred to as the GCMS QQQ. And we, we can do that, but this last caveat applies to that one. Doing it would appreciably slow down the throughput for the decision-making compounds, guaiacol and 4-methylguaiacol for this year. And in fact, if you were to phone us up and I believe um, that if we couldn't answer the question, I don't know of anyone else who could. Uh, if you said, Gordon, I got all these extended other markers that are not guaiacol and 4-methylguaiacol, and you said to me or to Eric, what do those mean? He'd say, we don't know. Um, because people would love to have those numbers and use them as it relates to sensory perhaps, but for decision-making tools right now, um, not. So this is a long explanation to tell you that what we, what we are offering today are two different analyses, we, uh, which is the berry analysis. Today, if they're received, I didn't look, we try to keep it up to date on the front of the website uh, in the disaster section, basically. And uh, I think it's six weeks out for a result, just because of that math that I was talking about. And on the on wine samples is the other one we offer as a result of micro fermentations or otherwise or real fermentations. And those are not as bad, uh, but probably now approaching four weeks out. Um, we have almost no room to do any sliding around in the queue or reprioritization. Some fella told me on the phone yesterday, half jokingly, well, I tried to bribe your folks and um, I'm sorry we have higher ethics than that to be um, sliding people around based on money. And this isn't about money for us. I, I've had some of my best friends say to me, well, gosh, Gordon, at least ETS is cleaning up and making money as a result of this thing. Well, I, you know, I, I don't wish it were true and it's not true. In fact, we'll be down over a million dollars as a result of this this thing because of analyses we didn't do on the instruments that are running smoke. And that's not to mention the additional nearly now $2 million of additional equipment we purchased for nothing other than smoke. Um, and just so we have a chance to answer that. Um, that that's the situation. Uh, the turnaround times are, are now, which is another new feature for the smoke compounds only are on your client portal if you log in for the <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> on your client portal, you'll see a due date. That due date is updated um, 
well, daily, and you could see it get, and I hope you will, get shorter and shorter as the additional instruments come online. I predict that's what's going to happen. You can also see it vacillate and go the other direction, sometimes temporarily. If an instrument goes down or needs maintenance or something else happens, it can certainly get longer as well. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Um, maybe that's a, a pretty complete um, answer. The, the other most frequently asked question is, well, <coughs> Gordon, can't you, can't you share what you found um, so that we can, we can draw conclusions? Well, sharing data, um, of course, is valuable. And we, uh, we certainly hope that folks, as it's appropriate, will share with one another within whatever groups they wish. But <clears throat> two things on that. First one is we don't own the data. That's our position. The data is owned by <clears throat> whomever submitted the sample and paid for it. It's not for us to decide <clears throat> how their data is used. Second part of that is that, um, is that people assume we have more information than we do. If you think about it, when samples come into our lab, um, we might we know who the client is and where their mailing address is, uh, but we might get samples labeled A or C or rows two to four, tank 15 or something like that. So in many, many cases, we don't have, uh, <clears throat> we don't know what the variety is, let alone where the location is or the combination of those two things. So well, folks often think we know more about what the results are that we have than we, than we do. So, but I, I do, I do um, think that it's enormously valuable for people perhaps within a, a given um, area to share it among themselves. I think we would, could all agree though, that a bunch of numbers out of context, if they were shared out with uh, folks without the appropriate background could be very damaging if they were used the wrong way in communications or in the press. Okay, um, I think that's a pretty good summary. I don't think I've forgotten any, any significantly uh, large thing. And <clears throat> even though my voice is kind of cracking from there's plenty of smoke where I'm sitting today, I'll try to go through the, the questions if they're here as they appear, um, <clears throat> put them in the Q&A and as, as we heard up front, if there are ones that we can't get to today, uh, we'll be glad to try to capture those and respond to you individually. Um, if you are not anonymous, of course, uh, and uh, in, in, as soon as we can. First one I have uh, is if we send the wine from previous vintages to get the bound compounds analyzed, will that give her a winery a baseline for our vineyard? And <clears throat> the answer would be yes, that would be valuable. Uh, that would be valuable information. Also, to I didn't quite explain this clearly, to a, um, to a large extent, um, building the baseline for the bound compounds, for the glycosylated compounds, <coughs> is, a, is an effort that ETS is undertaking without asking for any compensation. So should the samples that you're going to submit um, be useful, in our judgment, our mutual judgment for building that database, uh, we, and as far as I know today, uh, we there wouldn't be any charge for doing those. Uh, but you're, of course, you're would be agreeing that you're using those uh, for the purpose of building the database, and in fact, then to benefit a, if you will, greater good. Yep. There's another question. Uh, can you speak to the legal scenario of rejecting fruit before we have any results on smoke taint testing? Nope. Uh, I don't know. Um, this, uh, uh, and I wish I knew more. Anyone who can help me understand that better, <coughs> anyone who has um, friends in the, in the crop insurance industry, though I've spoken uh, and know now the people from the state that run that program, but the uh, the individual insurance companies, I do not know what they're doing. 
and I would like to know more. I'd be just so we could help with communicating with our clients. I spoke with uh, <clears throat> companies uh, over the past couple years who um, are interested in expanding their coverage of of <clears throat> of uh, smoke impact. I like the word smoke impact better than smoke taint. Just saying. And uh, and they those people also I don't know what's happening so I'm blind on that one. Um, I just the last last question here that's just three of them is is for, is a thanks and well thanks to all of you. Um, I hope it wasn't too long. Uh, I hope it didn't sound that we were being we were apologizing. We don't really feel that we need to apologize quite, uh, but I think we're we're all in a disaster. Um, each of you probably has a better name for it. I call it the zombie ap apocalypse today. And we're, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're all in it together. Um, oh, there is one more popped up and, and it's a good one. <clears throat> well, I'll be, and it's, could you include a question with the sample submission form asking if data could be released to Vintners or Growers Association? Well, Many of you may know and, and use already a feature that we have on our website that's called Vintage Portal, which was a brainchild of our own known and beloved Richard DeCenso. And Vintage Portal is an, is an effort to, <clears throat> to share data. And it, what happens with that mechanism is that, uh, it, but it's intended for, and to date it's been used for what should I say for the juice chemistry parameters, for example, maybe it's incorporating, I don't even know, uh, juice microbiology parameters, but it's to look at fruit maturation and compare how you're, you're doing as compared to maybe your, your neighbors. There are three, three elements to that that are important. Uh, by participating in this, in this thing, you're, um, you're agreeing and you specifically agree with some, the right language to share that data for mutual, mutual learning purposes. So that sort of changes that ownership that I was describing. And then, yeah, absolutely, it asks for a varietal, uh, your declaration of varietal. It also asks for a, uh, <clears throat> we have a list of sub-appellation codes for you to declare that goes with the with that variety. So <clears throat> one might say what a perfect tool <laughs> for this current situation uh, with the smoke. Um, I have to say that uh, we are we we're just shy of doing that because essentially every smoke result, not all, but almost all have uh, the potential of ending up in litigation, whether it results from <clears throat> whether it results from uh, something in, in the, with the insurance or whether it results from a uh, grower winery um, disagreement or something else like that. And anything that gets out there with that kind of knowledge then becomes discoverable in court as probably there's a lawyer on the phone who can correct me about the exact wording. But basically in our experience, this would make this stuff expose it to potential litigation later on. And I don't think that would benefit anyone in the inevitable fights coming down the road. We all hope that there are none. We all realistically will have to know that there may be some. Um, that's it from my side. Um, yeah, and I don't see any other questions. Uh, if, uh, uh, remember, if some question comes up, well, wait a minute, here are a couple more. I'm sorry, I didn't scroll down far enough. Do I have an opinion of whether there are good solutions to remove them? No, that's another no. Uh, we're certainly aware that there are many, um, that there are many uh, of uh, people out there offering things. We have definitely the tools and that glycosylated marker that we talked about uh, is one of an important tools to know whether these solutions are working. People talk about treatments happening and then it getting better and then having it come back. Uh, I've heard this multiple times. Well, tools are in place, the glycosylated thing, but if they came into the lab today, of course, for those reasons I discussed, we couldn't accept them, but a little later, yes. 
Uh, do any of the big wine companies have the testing equipment? <clears throat> they do, nothing like the numbers uh, that we have, but they certainly do. Um, I know that, uh, and, 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 they're, and they have very competent laboratories. They all will benefit from what I described earlier, especially on the glycosylated things of having the availability of standards. And these companies are, are undoubtedly running uh, either the, the, the panel that we do, the glycol and 4-methylglycol, and or the extended one. Um, a thanks. Uh, saying that I was eloquent, well, I wouldn't say that, about this complicated topic. And yeah, it's kind of hard to balance um, something this technical with not knowing the, the audience exactly. At, one point, at what point do I anticipate offering the testing on the unbound compounds for finished wine? <clears throat> unbound compounds, well, of course, we're doing those, those today in the sense of the guaiacol and 4-methylguaiacol. If we're talking about the, uh, the extended one, I don't think uh, the question was, will it be in December? Um, I, I hope not. I hope, I hope that we should be um, uh, from underneath the water by earlier than that. Let's call it mid-November, but it, certainly it would be November before we could uh, attempt to do significant numbers of those expanded panels. Um, if a berry returns a reading of 1.2, how does that correlate to a microferment? Um, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a, some interpretation, we call them interpretation guidelines. Okay. Guidelines based upon previous events may not apply to this year. I don't know. With all those caveats based on our experiences, and I'd be pleased to um, share that. Um, it, it will be mentioned again, but if you have uh, other specific questions like this, uh, in order to not um, back up all of our other communications, maybe use connect, connect at etslabs.com uh, and uh, well, we can share the, uh, uh, those, these guidelines. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's a little over half an hour and I, I hope that was useful for everybody. And of course, we're, we're here to help in any way we can use connect and we can respond. Thank you, Gordon. We really appreciate everything your team is doing and we're very excited to be able to provide this kind of status update for ETS Labs to our membership. If you do have any follow-up questions, um, please let me know directly at jesslyn at sonomawine.com. I also will get this recording out to all those that attended today. So thank you all, have a good rest of your day and good luck with the rest of Harvest 2020.